raised over $600,000 from more than 1,000 AB friends, alumni. So it's, yes. It's yes. It's our first time. Okay. Oh, okay. interesting. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. Oh,
We're going to start and thank you all for being here today. Um, I have a feeling you all may know Dr. Telhuk better than I even do, but I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction anyway. Uh, she started her career as a scientist and she went to AUB and got a PhD at Ohio State and then did postdoctoral studies at Berkeley. Her focus was trying to develop an understanding of nature in Lebanon. And she studied species of plants, asking questions like, is the population of the plants in this country healthy? And on the gene level, is there genetic diversity? Then midway through her career, she made a shift and thought, this is your train of thought, if I'm going to make a real impact on plant conservation in my lifetime, I'm going to have to work with people. And she shifted her focus to cultural nature instead of scientific nature, or more than scientific nature. Nature as something that we need for our health, therapeutic nature. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. At AUB, Dr. Talhuk is the chair of the landscape department. I served. Served as the chair. This is great. It's like being edited well. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences, founder of the Nature Conservation Center, and founding chair of AU Botanic, correct? And we are just really glad that you're here today and anxious to talk about this. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for taking the time to listen to these uh, three stories that I have for you. So we're going to go through three short 10-minute stories, and I think at the end we will entertain uh, questions that you may have. Okay, we're going to start by looking at how nature can impact uh, refugee women, and I will start with a video, and then we'll give you some more results of this study. الصراحة لما اجت وجابوا الاغراض نحن صرنا نحكي حالنا انه بالسنادق بينزرعوا يعني بلشنا فيهم بداية الامر نطلع انه ما ما راح يصير يعني ولا راح يزبطوا ما فيت بروسي الفكرة مزبوط يعني انه الزرع كيف بدك تسقي هيك وبالمقلوم افتكرت اول شيء يعني انه شلون بدي يطلع إذا الواحد أو الوحدة ما عندهم مجال وحابين يزرعوا فيهم يستعملوا مساحة الهواء ويزرعوا عموديا. قلنا نحن الأفضل هيك قول لا هيك مشينا نحطهم هون، هلا بعد ما جيبوا الحديد وركبناهم هون وطلع الشتل بين المنظر غير شكل. هيدي الطريقة التقنية موجودة بكل العالم. المهم انه الواحد ما يتكلف كثير ويقدر يطبقها بطريقه بتتكيف مع وضعه الشخصي المكان اللي هو عايش فيه. بدنا نحن عايشين ببناء كل شقه فيها ثلاث اوض وكل اوضه فيها عيله. اول شيء زرعنا عبينا الشلحوط تراب ورشينا البذر وصار يطلع شوي شوي وصاروا هيك مثل ما انك شايفه. هذا كزبره، روكا، رشاد، بقدونس، بقلي. من ما جميعه فرض الخاص بنشيل الشتله الضعيفه وبنترك النص على منيحه وبنترك عده شتلات بالشلحه وهول اللي بنخلينه بيصيروا اذا فردته بيصير العود عاسي واحسن يعني بيعطي انتاج ما بيصير هيك كثير لز بيصير ناعم انت بتقطفي منه وهو بيطلع وقت اللي انا بحتاج باخذ نعمل سلطه بتحط حول الاكل هيك يوم نصيون يوم ما نصيون ومنحط المي بالبريق 
منصير من رش لحتى تروى الشتلة مهندزة عدلتني وعلمتنا أنه كيف نعمي وخذنا الطريقة مني افتكرت أول شيء يعني أنه شون بدي يطلع بعدين لما انفرح وأشرت لنا خلاص عرفنا اقتنعنا أنه بتعملوا هيك وعاونتنا وعبت معنا وبدرته احنا صرنا نهتم فيه نحن بالجامعة الأمريكية بكلية الزراعة طورنا طريقة كتير بسيطة لزرع عموديا تتكل على استعمال صناديق الخضرة يلي هي متوفرة بكل الأماكن أول شيء الصندوق بيتعبى خلطة تراب وبعدين بتنكبس هيدي خلطة التراب بكرتونة أو ستايروفوم وبتتثبت والزرع بيصير من تاني ميلة من الصندوقة من ميلة المشبكة بتنقلب الصندوقة وبتنرش البذور على الشبك تبع الصندوقة وبتنكبس بقلب التراب ما لازم تتغمق كتير لأنه البذور الأعشاب وهيك صغيرة هي وبتنترك هالسنة دي على الأرض لمدة عشر أيام حتى تفرخ هالبذور وقت تفرخ البذور جزورة ببلشوا يمسكوا الترابات مشان هيك الزراعة العمودية بتنعمل بطريقة مرحلية يعني أول مرحلة منخلص ندي نايمين على الأرض مشان يطلعوا الشروش وتطلع النبتة بعدين منقلبهم منميلهم شوي مشان كمان لنخلي النبتة تتعود على أنه حتنقلب بتصير أفقية وش هالشروش بتمسك التراب أحسن وقت تطلع الشتل تصير طالعة منيح بقوة وشروشة مسكين التراب تالت جمعة نقلبهم ومنعلقهم على سقالة حديد أو على حيط طريقة الزراعة العمودية بالصناديق هي وحدة من الطرق بس في كتير مجالات الواحد يبتكر بالزراعة العمودية حسب المواد المتوفرة يعني صندوقة برميل بركة الشخص فيه هو يركب حيط مهم المفهوم هو ذاته إذا توفر للنبتة التراب والمي والغزة يلي هي بتعوزه لما عبيني هون العيلة كلها يتعبت وظبطت معني أنا صرت عبي فيهم قلب السلات ومشان نضغط مشان لما يطلع يصيروا منيح وزرعنا وربطنا شرطة نصبي وحطينا على جنب كنت عم بحكي مع أبو خالي أنا بعتي له صور عم فرجينا إحنا شو اشتغلنا يعني شو عملنا هون على المشروع هذا وإنه بيخبرني من هونيك إنه عاطينه أرض هني هني بهولندا بده يزرع فيها ما عم يعرف كيف هو بعتنا له فيديوهات نحن من هون نفس الطريقة هاي وكتير انبسط فيها يعني انه بده يشتغل نفس الطريقة اللي عاملينا The reason why we got involved in this project and why we were interested in introducing gardening to uh, Syrian women refugees is because I don't know uh, how many of you in the audience, but when you are a refugee, and I experienced being a refugee, some of you may have, there, there is the dramatic situation where it's an issue of health and safety and all these things. But there is also the situation where you are just sitting there and with nothing to do and you are bored. There is this time that happens also, this boredom, this feeling that you cannot do anything, you cannot go anywhere. And that contributes to the this depression and it contributes to feeling inadequate. And so we introduced this gardening to see does it help, does it help uh, contribute to their feeling better about themselves despite the difficult uh, conditions that they are experiencing. And what I'm showing you here are some quotes that uh, the participants relayed 
uh, uh, midway and after the gardening uh, program. So as you can see, when we ask them, you know, why did you join or how do, did you feel when you joined? And uh, you can see, so it takes my mind away from worries, it gets me distracted, forget, waste time, do something, have fun. I feel happy, I feel responsible, relaxed, changes my mood, peace of mind, I love gardening. So there is some basic, there is a basic need of just living a daily life that is peaceful, despite the dramatic situation that you are in as an individual. And uh, to support this finding, we actually conducted something called the Bex uh, Depression Index. So this is an index that measures uh, whether this contribution, this participation to gardening, helped alleviate uh, the level of depression. And so we measured uh, the level, uh, and it's a self-assessment, so the participants, they select the answers midway and at the end of the program. And our findings were uh, statistically significant, so professionally we could say that the gardening, gardening therapy, contributed to, um, it's not, I wouldn't say that they became happy, but they are less miserable uh, by uh, gardening. And for one-third of the participants, this drop in the depression index was actually clinically significant. So it was not just an academic exercise. So this is the first story that just to show that uh, nature intervention, it's a subtle intervention, it's not uh, something very direct, but it does contribute to uh, better living. The second project, the second story I want to tell you is the story of nature and children. And so while we are busy uh, with all our worries about adult worries, whatever they are, politics and economics and war, the children are what are what they are going to inherit whatever damage we do uh, today. And so the study that we had here was to say, okay. How do children see nature? Okay, I know how I see nature. I'm a scientist, adults, we know how they see nature. But how do children uh, perceive nature? And so we conducted a study in five uh, villages throughout Lebanon, and we made sure that uh, these locations are ecologically diverse, and also that the villages uh, the people in these villages come from different religious uh, backgrounds. And the project, the study is very simple. We just uh, gave them a one-day workshop, taught them how to take uh, photographs, and then we asked them to document nature. And uh, we made sure to tell them this is not an academic exercise, this is not a scientific exercise, whatever you want uh, to document as nature, go ahead and document. And this is a study that really came as a surprise to us because as a scientist, you ask someone to take a photo of nature and what do you expect? A tree, a flower, an insect, a bird, or something like this. And what I'm going to do now is show you some of the photographs that the children took. Okay? So this is Basma, she's 12 years old, and this is the photo. And then the important thing is that when they took the photos, we asked them to explain why they took this photo, to have a little narrative so that we have a better understanding of the background of the photo. So this is what Basma, uh, this is her explanation. So I do not want to leave just a flower painted on the wall for future generations. Okay, so already you can see how children see, have an abstract perception of nature, not only a literal one. This is Naifa, 12 years old, and this is how she explains. Okay. Sausan, 13 years old, and I would like to say, as a conservation specialist, these children, who are not exposed to conservation theories, really came up with very simple and yet very complex answers and uh, perceptions of nature. Okay, Hassan.
This is my favorite. You know, we ask someone to take a photo of nature, and they take a photo of their grandmother. So this is like your hardcore eco-health concept <laughs> of nature contributing to our health and well-being. everyday nature. And nature is what I do every day. Now let's look at the results because I, I don't have the time to show you all the photographs and the answers of the children. But I would like to point to uh, the first table, if you can see. And so we had 72 students from uh, five schools uh, participating. And what you have here is whether they took a photo of nature, of an agricultural setting, cultural setting, or just a symbolic. And notice that relatively to the others, taking a literal photo of nature is low. So the children are interested in nature in a, in a different dimension, okay, in a more personalized and more cultural aspect. And look at the narratives, when they explain why they took the photos, only 14% explain, I took this photo of a tree because trees sequester carbon dioxide and we need this to live, or because it affects climate change. Look at what they focus on. Family and emotions. Okay? And so, one of the outcomes of our study was it revealed the importance of the extended family, the importance of grandparents and uncles and parents. Because when you are a young child and you are in a safe environment, if your exposure to nature is with these people that you trust and they love you, this is your first step to becoming an eco-citizen. And in our case, most of our focus has been on environmental NGOs and scientific facts and scaring people about the dramatic things that are going to happen to our lives. And this is not what children need. Children need to be uh, associated with their parents and their families. They need, they, they will, there is much more value being with a relative that takes you just out and around and about and you do something that you enjoy, you enjoy the experience with your family rather than uh, getting uh, the skill or facts that make you more knowledgeable about the problems of the situation. And this affected a lot how we conduct conservation uh, communication and conservation strategies at American University of Beirut. Okay, so now we move on to the third story, which is the community. So, if we if you want to conserve nature, if you want the water to be clean, or if you want forests not to be destroyed, you have to start with the people living in, the, in these areas that you are targeting. So communities are very important. They are the ones that are going to conserve nature if they see a benefit to them. Okay? For us, for example, living in Beirut, I cannot. Go up. I live in Beirut. I destroyed everything where I live. Everything, there is nothing, no forest, nothing. I cannot go to a place where nature still exists and ask people to do nothing because I want that place to remain uh, conserved. I have to see what this person is interested in and how they see nature and how they can conserve nature. So working with the community and understanding the perception of the community is a very important uh, approach. So the approach that we have is a people-centered approach. And one of the uh, important aspects of nature, unless you're a scientist and you are specialized in different species and different ecosystems, and that would be maybe 0.001% of the global world population, for the majority of people, Nature is whatever, it's your everyday thing that you see, what you think, what you associate yourself with. 
So nature, you see it through your culture, through, through your spirituality, through your everyday routine. And so maybe one place that for me is nature and is very important for someone else, it may mean nothing. Okay, so it, nature is not something, an absolute, and there is a benchmark, and then you say, this is nature and this is not nature, okay? This is something that at some point becomes very uh, personal also, a personal experience. And so this is why if there is, some, there is something like the cultural identity of nature. So if you want to con conduct conservation, you have to look at the culture. You have to be field responsive and understand and start from that basis. And so uh, our interest in this project it was to document how communities and individuals in rural villages value nature, value their heritage. What do they see? Okay, we know what we see, but we don't know what they see in their villages. And so we had a goal which uh, spans through three phases. The first phase was to develop a participatory methodology where we can get everyone on board and try to understand from them what is their understanding of their local nature. The second phase was to actually transform this into a digital platform where everyone can contribute. And the third phase is to make sure, make use of all this data and all this rallying to actually start sustainable development and local planning at the local level by empowering local communities. So the first project, the first phase, we call the Baldati Viati. And uh, basically, it's very simple. We decided to unlearn. We went as AUB, and we didn't go with any agenda or anything. We just took a, a Google map, and we met with the community like you're sitting here. And we gave them options uh, of things that they can think about. And we asked them to just locate any natural or cultural landmark in their own village. Okay? Without saying, you have this, you have that, or whatever. We want to understand what they see, what they have. And this becomes the basis of uh, where, where we start with our conservation activities. So since 2011, we worked uh, with 70 municipalities. We had 554 volunteers from different villages forming committees, meeting with each other. So the map would keep going back and forth in the village for like six months before they complete all the data. Because what would we ask them? We say, so do you have a forest area? Yes, we have this woodland. Is there a place where you want to do reforestation? Yes, there is this area. Okay, is there a place where you can harvest white plants? And then they would not know, and then they start thinking, okay, who do we know? Ah, uh, there is, um, I don't know what, let's go ask her. Is there a place where you can watch birds? Is there a place where you can just have a beautiful view? You can watch the stars, you can walk, you can hike, etc. So it took six months of sharing this map with the community and going to different people until they felt they completed their, um, their map. And so we had uh, collected by then 3,200 uh, natural and cultural landmarks. And we organized public exhibits. And all this work we did in collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Education, because we are involving the community in different ways. Offic the local authorities through the Ministry of Interior. We were involving the youth through the uh, Ministry of Education. And of course, the Ministry of Tourism, because uh, this becomes an important database for the national strategy to promote rural uh, tourism. Okay, after we worked with about, um, almost we hit the 100 villages, it became very evident that working on paper maps is not enough to share uh, all this information. And this is when we moved uh, to the option of developing a digital platform. So a phone application, okay? Basically a phone application. And this is the phase that we are in now, the second phase. What is our aim? We just want to have 
a community of users. We want to create a national repository. And I just want to say that uh, our position as the American University is very important because everyone trusts us with the data. Everyone is willing to share information. They feel that it is a repository, it is a place that is trustworthy, there are no uh, commercial intents, and it is uh, information that is here to, to stay as an academic institution. Uh, our target is all the Lebanese, all the friends of Lebanon, and really what we want is to collect information as seen by the people. We don't want experts to come from outside and tell us this is who you are, this is what you have, this is what you should do, etc. We want to start and develop a, a personal understanding, a local understanding of what are our capacities. And so how is the digital platform organized? How did we ask villages to fill the data? Basically, we have six categories. Okay, so one category is nature encounters, cultural experiences, local services, and in every one, as you can see, there is bird watering areas, natural beaches, botanizing areas, observing wild plants, archaeology, village walks, uh, local skills, a carpenter, metal worker, um, and then we have food and lodging, fillin, cafe, uh, pub. Uh, wineries, distilleries, uh, biking, hiking trails, all the micro enterprises that are nature based, all of them organic farms, for, uh, reforestation sites. This is a sample of, we have, I think, more than 70 something icons that the villages can select from. And then they can, they can geo reference themselves, talk about who they are, what they are, their contact, and all the information. And so this digital platform we call the Daskara. Uh, in Arabic, it means Al Qarya Al Arika, an authentic village. And then we came up with a definition of what a Daskarji is, and we're inviting everyone to become a Daskarji. So basically, if you are passionate about discovering and conserving nature and heritage, and then you believe that the best way is for this to happen is if the local residents are the guardians and the beneficiaries of these uh, landmarks, okay? So it's something local, it's something that comes from within, then you are a Daskarji, and then you contribute to uh, Daskar. What, what is, again, Daskarji? What's the... It's a definition that we came yeah. up with. What is it? So, you said Daya. So, Daya. Daskara, al Qarya al Authentic village. And then the discussion becomes what? Me and you and everyone who wants to contribute to Daskara. Okay, so at this stage, uh, the features that we have is uh, how to add location. You can add a location. We're still in a beta version, in the early version of the digital platform. And you can use it to find some of these landmarks. It's still we're in the early process. But the upcoming features, which we already developed and we are in the process of uh, adding to this platform, is a comprehensive sustainable development platform that includes an e-commerce called Bantouj. So how many of those living in <coughs> Lebanon like to buy Z Zaytun from someone from that village specifically? And so what will happen with Bantouj you just say, I want uh, the Z Zaytun from Abu Eli from this village. And then Abu Eli receives a message, and then they send it, and it's home delivery. It's all within Lebanon, okay? And so here, as you can see, we are starting to support uh, local entrepreneurs, uh, homemade products. The other thing is a marketing tool. There are many young people, especially young people, that are operating businesses uh, there is uh, someone who takes you on stargazing feeds and someone who takes you on white plant walks, etc. And they don't have a way to market themselves. It's not easy for, for you to book, to understand how to get to them. And so it is going also to be 
We also have a feature that is going to be a marketing tool for major culture-based micro-enterprises. It is going to be a go-to place for education. Of course, all the information that is collected is verified, is uh, verified locally and is verified uh, academically. And last but not least, uh, the ultimate uh, eventual, it is going to serve as a crowdfunding platform where we have local projects. Local projects are community approved and then they become, uh, they work their way up to become, to be uh, crowdfunded for, through our platform, through AUB, and then we help uh, local planning and local development in a way that does not dictate agendas, but that starts bottom up. Okay, so it starts with the people, with the communities, we have to provide evidence of consensus building, and then from there, it works itself into the platform, and then we start uh, helping with the diaspora, we have to start helping by crowdfunding for these projects. Okay, so uh, many people ask us, so what is Daskara? Daskara is a money-generating project at AUB. The idea is that we want to become sustainable. We have received a significant fund from Diane Foundation, but one of the things that this foundation is helping us do is help yourself. Start, you are doing something very good. Stop asking for always people to support you. Find a way to become sustainable through your operation. So this is what we aim for. And uh, we are see, we, our plan is to become sustainable in five years. So we will still need subsidy within the coming five years and then we become uh, sustainable. And then I want to end with this hot of the press, small one minute clip. Uh, our official launch is uh, going to be in May. We just have this little clip that was just finished. ايام بيطلع عبالنا نكسر الروتين نروح على مطرح جديد مطرح مش بعيد مش صعبة لأن تعرفوا بعالمنا ذاته في عالم تاني حدك تعو نكتشف لبنان من أول وجديد تعو نركز على شو في دسكرة أبليكيشن نتشارك فيها شو في بديعنا في مشوار حلو مع الأصحاب ونومي بأوتيل مليون نجمة في دكنجة مهضوم وقديم في عالم ناطرينك تيدخلك أطيب أكل في زهور نادرة ومشاهدة طيور ناس بتربي نحل وحرفيين وفنانين وفي كتير اشياء كيف؟ بكبسة زر لا عن جد بكبسة زر بدسكرة زيدوا على خريطتنا المناطق يلي بتعني لكم من ضياعكم لأن كل ما كنا أكتر كل ما قدرنا نقشع شو فيه ونركز على الاشياء الحلوة ونحميها ونبلش من مطرح ما نحنا تنروح على مطرح أحلى مطرح جديد ومش بعيد Okay, with this we conclude the presentation and I think we're all...